Hello, welcome to Breaking It All Down. I am Count Zero. This is not the saboteur blog you're looking for, or the review you're looking for. Because, you see, well, long story short, last week was nuts. It was insane. I had a whole bunch of stuff come up, job interviews, errand running, teeth cleaning, all this, that, and the other thing. So, I wasn't able to get that review done in time before a little thing came up called Comoricon which is where I was at last weekend, and which is what I am here to vlog to you about today, if you weren't paying attention during the little opening title card thing at the beginning of the video. So, yep, Comoricon this year was in Vancouver, Washington. I would do the usual Oregonian, Portland metro area resident joke about Vancouver being a suburb of Portland, but Comoricon next year is back in Vancouver, and I don't want to have my tires psychically slashed by all of Vancouver as I cross the bridge. So with that in the little thing done, I'm just going to talk about the convention. I had fun. I did not meet any of my viewer there, but to be fair, I forgot to tell you that I was going to the convention before I went to the convention, so when I got to the convention, you didn't know to look for me there and nobody there was looking for me and going, oh, hey, it's Count Zero, the guy who watches the video show that I watch on occasion. So, yeah, that that's not a thing that happened. Um, also, in my infinite brilliance, I failed to promote the show to absolutely anyone. So, if you somehow stumbled across this video series after having attended Kimura Khan and you saw me there, thank you for finding this. It is sheer luck that I managed to get you to come here in the first place through my lack of psychic emanations of any of the kind. Speaking of psychic emanations, um, I was talking about the panels I went to and stuff starting on day one. Well, first, opening ceremonies were really good. Um, their opening ceremonies, I will say that the rules video isn't quite, that's not my favorite to Morricon rules video. That's the uh, 2009 one that the Anime Hunters did. But it was a pretty good rules video. Um, also did everything fancy like it was like 2010 one where they had a Taiko group come on stage, which was really cool. But in of that, but anyway, immediately after opening ceremonies, we had the Funimation panel. Nothing really there, I suspect, was a really new license announcement. But there was thing one thing that was new to me, and that was tying into the horribly segued psychic emanations remark that this anime has been licensed rescued by Funimation. This makes me ecstatic. Um, I'm just going to edit the Numfar Do the Jance Dance of Joy clip in right here. Numfar, do the dance of joy. Uh... Yeah, that. This is great. Akira is one of those anime and manga... I mean, it's just like both, both, both the anime and manga, which need to stay in print. They are a big part, in my opinion, for of, of the influential works of anime and manga. In terms of, not just in terms of like other creators, but in terms of anime and manga fandom and the otaku culture in the United States. There's a massive number of people who came in thanks to that. Um, it is a seminal work in this genre. It is something which really really people need to have access to. My, and when I heard that Bandai was stopping publication and they were going to phase out their U.S. anime business, the whole Bandai Entertainment thing, it made me sad, because there's a lot of good stuff that they had licensed that won't be available anymore, and my inner wannabe librarian always feels bad when something like that happens. So learning that Funimation has saved this is good. It means I don't have to you know, do a massive letter-writing campaign and organize all that stuff to get the Criterion Collection to license this, which was my plan B. Um, I still have to do that for Wings of Honiamis, but maybe someone else will save me the hassle. So, that's done. Yeah. Um, anyway. So, after that, 
here. Do a bit of wandering around for a bit. Um, so I'm going to talk, use this to talk a bit about the convention itself. Well, this is Komorikon's highest attendance ever in the vicinity of, oh, making a rough estimate ballpark figure. Um, 4,000 people, maybe, um, on the higher end of that. Komorikon is a convention which, it's not a big one. I mean, I've been to San Diego Comic Con. It doesn't come close to that. But it's a convention which feels, which has an intimate feel. Um, without feeling crowded. This particularly is true in Vancouver. Um, I went to it a couple times when they had it in Portland at the Hilton Hotel Towers near downtown Portland, about a block away from Pioneer Courthouse Square. And at those locations, it was cramped, it was confined. Um, there were a lot of problems with having to manage the, you know, fire space limits, the number of people in one place at one time. Um, avoid crowding and avoid getting the fire marshals pissed off. Um, and to a degree of those occasions, because, because they're in downtown Portland, well, yes, you had, like, you know, several restaurants to eat within close proximity to each other. They're missing one thing which Vancouver has, which is a park immediately across the street from the hotel. I mean, yes, the venues in downtown Portland were, like, short walk away from the park blocks and from Pioneer Courthouse Square, but it, those locations didn't quite have the same degree of immediacy. You had to walk a bit, like a, a block or half a block to get there. And before you go, oh, poor baby, you can't walk half a block. Oh, it's so terrible. I understand that. I, I walk a lot. But it removes that sense of immediacy of you walk out the door, you or you turn your head to one side and go, oh, there's the conven there's the parks and then there's the convention. You use that psychological effect of as you're coming in, you find the convention by the people crossing the street back and forth between the park and the hotel. It, it, it's a certain degree of certain thing which is missing there, um, which I feel that Vancouver provides that Comoricon in down to Portland, Portland at the hotel at the Hiltons didn't have. That said, also there's the fact of due to how the well, we schedule the con how the convention is scheduled and how they do the Channel 8 studio at the square, we miss out on every possible opportunity of, with them having studio at the square, having, like, a whole bunch of people dressed as characters from Hitalia standing behind Stephanie Strickland as she's discussing the news. Which, if we ever do come back to Portland, um, and do downtown at the Hiltons, we need to, like, do a cosplay gathering before the convention at Studio at the Square, or alternatively, KGW needs to do a special episode of Studio at the Square just around the time of Komorikon so we can have characters from Italia or Naruto or um, Bleach or Inuyasha or whatever the new hotness is at that time behind them just for the sheer awesome that would be. Like, hell, we'll get, air, get a whole bunch of people dressed up as all of the members of Daiguren. Not just, you know, Yoko, um, Kamina, and Simone, but um, back then. Something. Make our presence known, if you will. Anyway, that. So having the park there was a big thing. Um, also, I think the thing that the park, that it's added benefit is, when you're in downtown Portland, you have, you have eateries, you have food carts, and that sort of thing. Sort of. Um, but the main food cart gathering places are actually a bit of a distance away. Um, whereas in Vancouver, around the time the Comoricon happens, Vancouver also has its farmer's market at the park that's right across from the, con from the hotel, the convention hotel. And that adds a nice little bonus touch there of, you have a large variety of different types of food, not just, you know, pizza, sub sandwiches, and burgers, that's right nearby. You can go in, you can get uh, pad thai, you can get hand-dipped corn dogs, you can get, yes, pizza, you can get uh, Philly, you can get burritos, you can get all sorts of different kinds of stuff. And that adds a degree of awesome just to that one venue there. Um, 
The convention itself was split up between two different uh, hotels. We had everything at the um, at the Vancouver Hilton, while as far as like the panels and the viewing room, sort of, and the manga library and that sort of thing at the Hilton, and then a bit of a walk away at the Red Lion uh, down the street. It's about oh, a five minute walk, five minute or less walk, depending on how brisk you want to do it. Was the uh, dealer's room at the and the artist alley? On the one hand, it gives you a chance to get out, get some fresh air, get a little bit of extra exercise that you wouldn't have gotten anyway. <sighs> On the other hand, it puts a bit of like psychological distance there that I think it did necess that this didn't necessarily need. Um, additionally, they separated out the artist alley and the. Uh, exhibitor space into two different little wings of the Red Lion Hotel. And further with how they did this, um, the space for the dealer's room feel a lot more confined than any of the other dealer's rooms than I've been to at Comoricon. This is like my third, uh, fourth after Comoricon. Uh, it felt much more cramped and confined. Um, I'm not sure what to think about this because it may feel like there are less dealers there. Admittedly, what may have happened is there may have actually been, indeed, less dealers who signed up for the convention, and so they couldn't justify using a larger space for them this time. And it, so, I, if so, I totally get it. On the other hand, though, it just it, it, it felt a little psychologically off. And instead, what they did is they put in the uh, parking garage, which the last time I went to a Vancouver Comoricon is where the dealer's room was, down there was the board game space, the video game space, and registration. This did have the advantage for it made it, it made registration lines less of an obnoxious thing. It had where when you were checking in or whatever, instead of having to go into the hotel and clogging up the exact same lines that you had for for people waiting to get into opening ceremonies, and leading to confusion there. Everything was nice and neat and straightforward. I totally understand putting registration down that parking garage. Problem is by I guess by putting the um yeah it just I, I would have kind of preferred they found a way to put the dealer's room down there too or something. I dunno. I'm not sure how, how we work out the logistics of that. I would have would have gone to rant and rave to discuss this, but my registration at the parking garage was nearing its end and I had to go. I were being ahead of myself. Um other than that, the main thing I went to on um, the Saturday of the convention, for those who don't know, Comoricon, instead of running Friday, Saturday, Sunday, like most conventions like PAX and Worldcon, which are run counter to it, it runs Saturday, Sunday, Monday, which I think actually works nicely into its favor. Um, and it gives the advantage where if they do ever grow enough to need to be a four-day convention, they can just add Friday to the mix, and it's not too big of a thing. Um, anyway, yeah, it, it's, it's a weekend that gives you an opportunity for expansion if necessary, but it also gives you one day of the convention, which is not pat, which, um, with PAX being around the same time, you have one day, which is not overlapped with PAX. So if people want to just stop in for like one day for like the last Monday, check out the dealer room, maybe go to a few panels and see some stuff in the viewing room, there's something there that they have a chance to do that. Which is nice. Uh, so, anyway, the panel I went, last panel I went to on Saturday was the Anime Fans 25 and Older panel. This is basically for, I'm not going to say the old geezers or elder statesmen of anime. There are, there, there are those who fall in that category who are significantly older than me. The people who, like, well, um, I'll get ahead of myself here, like, one of the people, one of the guests of the convention, Carl Gustav Horn, who came in basically at the very beginning of anime fandom in the United States. He's an elder statesman, I am not. Um, but people who are, who are reaching that age of anime fans where we're not the young kids anymore, we don't have the young kid tastes, and kind of, it was, it was, I'm not going to say this panel was a bunch of people going, damn kids, get off of our lawns, because it wasn't, which is good, which is what the last thing we needed to be. Um, it was kind of a situation of how 
as old fan of older fans to basically to keep our to keep ourselves in the game to help share our love of older anime like Akira, Ghost in the Shell, and that sort of stuff with the younger fans, while also kind of um, not trying to come across as like a bunch of old fuddy duddies and other useful stuff like that, and how to, how, how to try to relate to the younger generation and, ha and help the younger generation enjoy what we love about this fan, this fandom, this this wonderful medium of fiction that we enjoy so much. And those are the two main things for day one. There were a few other things I went to. Um, I went to the dealer's room. I always usually go plan for a dealer room is go on, once on the first day to make sure that there's something I want to get. I give a chance to get it. And then on the last day, when people are clearing stuff out and prices are lower than they are usually, to see if they can grab some neat stuff. But for those, I will cover at the end with the swag haul. Both that done, um, I did not go day two. There was only one panel I wanted to go to. It was early in the morning. It was an hour long. And for me living basically halfway between um, Salem and Portland, that's a hell of a drive. It's a good thing I didn't go because, well, I did not record this. Another person at Kamorakan did, but this happened. What a romantic moonlit night. Yeah, but, oh man. That video is of the Thunderbird Hotel on the Willamette River, sorry, the Columbia River, catching the hell on fire. And that video was by um, Kimono MK. I will give you credit in the show notes. That video is very, very impressive. I haven't seen that much video of this. I've seen pictures on like KGW and stuff, but good job catching that video. Um, and that was a big fire. It was a fire alarm fire. The entire th this hotel. This is not, by the way, the Red Lion on the other side of the Willamette, on the Portland side, where Kamora Com Khan held its like second or third um, event at. That one is still there and still standing, which which is good. I'd hate to I'd hate to have Kamora Khan lose a piece of history on its tenth anniversary. Um, but yeah, the Thunderbird completely gone, completely caught in flames. There's a police investigation. As of this recording, there are people from the Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms um, Bureau. They are investigating this for a possible arson investigation. The Oregonian ran an article about how the owner of the hotel owes a million dollars in back's property taxes. This is just going to be a big old fun saga. That, that if you're in Portland, follow the local news. This is going to be interesting. If you're not in Portland... Go to OregonLive.com and subscribe to their news feeds, and you'll be able to follow this there. Or listen to OPB streaming on the internet. Anyway, there's enough of that. Um, so I did not go that day. From what I've gathered, traffic on I-5 any direction going over the Columbia was a bloody mess between having to deal with the smoke and having to deal with the rubberneckers, because, I mean, that's a spectacle right there um for large chunks of the day i mean when i came back from the convention when i went when i went on sunday i was coming back at around 6 p.m on sorry, um, on monday i was coming back on 6 p.m on monday they were still dousing it with fire There's still hot spots and they didn't get it cleared up and cleared up enough that the atf guys could come in until today so give you an idea about how big and how hot this fire was and how much this would have messed up traffic so to a certain degree, I'm kind of glad, glad I didn't go. I kind of wish I, in retrospect, I had also just to hear the conversations about, oh, yeah, there's a fire, and people going over to the Red Lion and um, looking out the river to kind of rubberneck on the whole thing. So, on the one hand, I kind of wish I didn't. I wish I did go. On the other hand, I'm kind of glad I didn't. Um, Monday, I went to the Dark... I did go, and I went to the Dark Horse Comics panel. Um... If there was an announcements thing at the beginning for, for upcoming stuff, I missed that, and if so, I'm bummed I missed it. 
but it was still a good panel. I was there for basically about an hour or so of Q and A, um, with among a couple other Dark Horse people, the great Carl Gustav Horn. I'm, I feel like I'm spouting like a whole bunch of, ex- um, I'm pumping him up a bit too much, but there's an episode of the A and N cast, the Anime News Network podcast, where they interviewed him from like a year or so ago. Actually, he's a somewhat regular guest, so probably a year or so, probably another one more recently. One and ones earlier than that. He is really an elder statesman of anime of the anime fandom, having worked basically everywhere, not just at Dark Horse, but at Viz, um, having written for anime magazines like An America, who someone who helped kind of try to get Wings of Honiamis, which I mentioned earlier, brought out to the United States. Um, if you have a chance to attend a panel that he's at at the convention, go to it. Um, actually, if Jason Thompson and he ever do a redux of their Secret History of Manga panel at an anime convention, and I know they did it at KimuraCon, if they do it again at a bigger con like Otakon or Anime Expo, for the love of God, go! And I don't care if the big Italian meetups at the same time, or if there's some other thing, go to that panel, it's a, you will learn shit! Pardon my language. I went to that panel. It was amazing um, in terms of just being able to be in the same room with some of the editors at Dark Horse. It it sounds like I'm gushing over much about Dark Horse, but the thing is, with the Funimation panel earlier, we got announcements, but I will admit that the person we had for Funimation, when it comes to talking about what goes on at Funimation, she was in a position where she couldn't talk about that. Maybe not that she didn't know, but that she didn't have the information or was prohibited from talking about this much. With the Dark Horse panel, we had three people there, and I feel bad for having missed all their names because I came in too late, but who work on manga, either translating or editing it, who love manga, who read it in their spare time, and this panel was was wasn't just about oh, what's Dark Horse doing in industry stuff? But there's also a degree of, when you work at a company like Dark Horse and you have people who work on manga so much as these people do and who care and who do this for the love of the genre, love of the medium, um, we just get really good discussions about what they like about manga, about the titles they like, about what they want to see in manga in the future, um, and how the media, and how the, um, industry is going and in, in, in interesting ways about how what they want to see in the industry in the future. Like, for example, we had a whole bunch of interesting discussion about the uh, digital side of things with uh, Dark Horse and their attempts to publish manga digitally through their own apps in the iTunes and Android App Store. Which, by the way, if you didn't know, Dark Horse Comics has manga on their app. If you didn't know this. I, I do know about this. I have their app and stuff. Anyway, what I'm trying to say is you should get manga through the Dark Horse app. And I mean, but we're talking about how the, the steps they need to go through to get approval to get stuff like um, one of the titles, for example, that I have on my um, picked up at the mo- picked up at the con, getting that getting that on their app, and which you can also kind of read into the same sort of problem that Viz runs into and Yen Press, and that sort of thing. It's a whole interesting thing. I wish I recorded it. Actually, I wish I had a tape recorder, or a video camera, or something so I could record the whole panel. Um. And other than that, went to closing ceremonies. It was great. The AMV contest was really good. Um, I will try to look up, see if they have the results of the AMV contest and pictures of the cosplay contest winners and stuff on the Kamorakon webpage and put that in the show notes. And I just do a link to Kamorakon's webpage. Um, so enough rambling about what I did over the course of the convention. Let's talk... Also, I'm doing this all of which while my broken light, which I will be fixing if you don't clear up your act. Um, enough with the, with all of that and dealing with their blinking lights. Let's talk about what I got. Well, this is my day one purchase. Um, picked up Bacano. I reviewed this for Bureau42.com. If you've discovered my stuff through Bureau42, then you've seen this, then you've read my review of this, hopefully. If not, I'll put a link in the show notes. This is one of those shows where I didn't own it until now, and it's a show where I feel bad for having not owned it before. 
I have a short list of, of shows and manga and stuff where I enjoyed the original work immensely. I love it. It's one of my favorite shows, and I'm bummed that I and I feel bad for not having purchased a copy to support it, or to support the creators. And instead, I rented it from Netflix or watched it streaming or that sort of thing. I still, in my own way, supported the creators by watching it through legal means, but it's not the same. You know, it's not like oh, I own this. I it's part of my collection. I can watch this whenever I want to. With Bacano, I own it. I can watch it whenever I want to. And I feel better that for having made sure that I supported the creators just a little bit more. The next thing I picked up is a manga, which, I mean, the, the anime got a certain degree of controversy around it because of its subject matter and the thought that it went a bit too much of the moe genre. But there was enough praise about this at the Dark Horse panel from people I trust, um, in terms of on the panel, that I said, what the heck, and... For people like Kimura Khan, you actually chance to buy this manga before everyone else did for ten dollars, which is less than the rest of you are going to have to pay. The rest of the rest of you have to pay a few bucks more. Uh, that is Arimo Volume One. Um, basically, the premise of the manga and the book it's based on and the anime series it's based on is basically. Um, and this is going to sound bad. I mean, just having... Anyway. Is... The main character is this guy who's little, who discovers his little sister is a diehard uber geek. Uh, this is a secret persona she has. A secret persona, a secret side of her thing that she has. Normally, she is the popular girl. She does... She is a track star. She's, she's basically kind of like... If... I guess the best comparison would be if you did this as a sitcom. Where... The main character of the show discovers that is a ordinary average every every student. In fact, basically he sets up that he isn't every student, he isn't every man, and he likes it that way. He discovers that his basically more popular sister is all as a more popular jock sister is in fact an Uber geek. And that's her secret identity, her little secret shame. Um and using this as familial bonding. And to be clear, basically the main reason why this kind of gets weird in the Moe genre is the sister, her part of her uber geekness is that she plays what are known as Syscon dating sim games. Um, do a Google search, leave safe search, search on, and that's pro and that's kind of where the weird bit comes in in terms of for where the controversy came out for the show because there's this whole thing with the mower genre and I don't want to go into it right now because I'm talking about my swag haul. So I've started reading the manga. I watched a little bit of the first episode on uh, Hulu. I kind of like the manga a little more because the manga feels like it's paced better. The show feels like it beats you over the head with stuff and. So we'll see. I'll try both out. Um, I'm not going to do a review of them on the blo on the the video. Um, I'll let do an actual text blog post. But anyway, enough of that. Those were not my main things that I was that I was hunting for, though. So those are things where, if I waited a bit, if I hunted online a bit, I could get them from. Right stuff. I could get them from Amazon. That sort of thing. I could get them digitally through the various digital distribution, legal digital distribution channels. Those were not what I was really looking for. Because when it comes to conventions and anime conventions, I've discovered what is my thing. Uh, as I like looking for the out of print stuff, the hard to find stuff, and in particular, the thing which you can find at the conventions that you can't necessarily find as well other places or as easily or purchase as logistic in a or user friendly fashion in other places is the older manga or the older published manga. And what I mean is this back in the day, admittedly, with back in the day being as late as early as the mid 90s, mid to late 90s, manga was not published in the Tonko Bon in the graphic novel format, is what I just showed you with Oremo. It was published chapter by chapter in comic book format. 
If you've read my stuff on Bureau 42, you may remember I reviewed a manga called Cosmo Warrior or Cosmo Police Justy. Um, that was a manga which I enjoyed. I picked up in graphic, in comic book format on the version that was originally published by Viz at KimuraCon. This year, I picked up three more manga. I did not pick up the one I was hoping for, which was last time I was there, they had Area 88, and I wished I picked up that. Instead, I picked up three others. Admittedly, three which were later compiled into graphic novel format, but I still figured worth picking up anyway. Um, first one I picked up was Record of Lotus War, The Lady of Ferris. This is actually a prequel to the original OVAs and the original novels. And this covers basically how Bell and Wart and, and all of them, uh, I forget the name of the, um, king of the good kingdom um from the first arc of record of lost war um but all of them basically work together to defeat this great evil that's threatening the land and all it ultimately led to them breaking up and that sort of thing a really good art style it's it's a little wonky in terms of her layout how uh, the layout's done but it reminds me a lot of old sword and sorcery comics and like it reminds me of Frazetta in all the right ways, in terms of his attention to detail and that sort of thing. Let me see if I can find a good one. Like, oh, Hero, this is perfect. Um, this is a nice big two-page spread. Sorry for the frame drop there. Um, let's see if you can see this. And this actually looks a lot better on the comic book page than it does on the graphic on the graphic novel the graphic novel everything's compiled down and shrunk down to much more concise and tight and it's stuff gets cropped or it feels like it gets cropped even if it isn't so i'm glad i picked this up um the other two i picked up were another one which i think i've read it's been a while though and it's notable because from a different publisher because this one the manga compilation was published by the same people who did the comic Central Park Media. Uh, if you know anything about old school publishers of I mean, manga and that sort of thing, you might chuckle a bit at this because Central Park Media, they had a second label which also did their Lotus DVD releases called U.S. Manga Core, which was just used for DVD action and fantasy and sci-fi anime on DVD. They never released any manga under the U.S. Manga Core label. They only released anime and anime got released under Central Park Media Manga, or the, the manga was released under Central Park Media Manga. And I can't help but chuckle a little bit over that. Admittedly, the U.S. Manga Core brand came out first, but still. The other stuff I picked up was, um, volume, was book two and book three of uh, Masamuni Shiro's Appleseed. And if you notice something here, that is not Masamuni Shiro's art on the cover. This is, it's a Shirao manga. It is, actually has on the inside the stuff that you expect from a Masamuni, as far as Masamuni Shirao's art. But not all this art on here is by Shirao. As far as the cover, some of this is by other people like this. Not Shirao at all. I also noticed it's, if you've picked up the graphic novels releases that came later, while they're still using the Studio Proteus, let me put this up here, the Studio Proteus publication, um, the company that published it is Eclipse International. They were one of the earlier companies who started out doing anime and manga and then got out of the game later for various silly, stupid reasons, basically with the management deciding, oh, we're going to poo-poo this anime and manga stuff now. Um, we're too cool for, for that stuff. And, Let's just say Eclipse International no longer exists in the same fashion that, say, Dark Horse and Viz and those other companies did. So, it's interesting to pick these up now. Um, I'm, definitely, I'm definitely going to read all of these. I mean, I'm a, uh, I, mean I, I don't buy comics just to sit them on the shelf and not read them. I don't buy manga and anime just to sit them on the shelf and not watch them. I am going to watch these in the future and read these and I may give my thoughts in a video or something like that probably for some of this stuff I might do more as a text review just cuz that way you don't have to 
deal with scanning the stuff and doing the Ken Burns effect. You may anticipate, you may be able to see some anime and manga reviews from me in the future. I'm planning on doing a thing which I'm going to call with the working title of "Can't Get There From Here," where I do various discussions of anime and manga that either unlicensed, that are currently not licensed, had been licensed pre pre ah, previously, and their licenses has faded, or well, various other things where you can't get them legally in the United States. Um and discussing about whether these are any good and if you're interested how you can support the creators if you purchase them used or attain them from other means but that's something for another time until then though next week i will hopefully have my review of the saboteur but until then i'm got zero like thank you for watching mm -hmm.